Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thank you for joining me again today. I have Patricia Boswell. She is going to talk to us today about how to provide loving and joyful care at home, which is something I knew I couldn't do with my mom. So I'm glad that she's with us today. Thanks for joining us, Patricia. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So why don't you give us your background and how you how you came to talk to me today? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just tell you, my background is, uh, is nursing and business, and I incorporate it all the time. But my nursing part has a lot of history. You don't have a lot of time, but let me just say this. In the last 12 years, I focused on home care, hospice, and during that period of time, I was able to focus on Alzheimer's and dementia, a clientele, and doing a lot of observations within the home and looking at how people are living with the disease, but also how they've been planning and not planning for the disease. Because they sort of see the disease is here, but everybody's in denial about the disease and what the person is saying, doing, and how to not have a crisis, but they're already in crisis. <laughs> yep. Most of us do not plan for that kind of golden years, to say the least. And I just want to point out, Patricia is in her backyard in New York, and so you get the added benefit of the beautiful bird sounds in the background today. So. Yes, I love, I love my backyard. I do all my flowers, my planting. I have someone who does my grass and my greenery, but I design my yard every year differently with flowers and all. And I've sort of cut back on some of the flowers because now I'm calling it the retirement yard because it does take a lot of work and I'm very busy and flowers do need to be fed, talked to, and watered. <laughs> so that also brings me into, that's a great activity for you and your loved one to do. It's gardening. It's great exercise. It's good mental. Uh, it's stressless. So it allows you to be creative and to think about what you are going to do and what you have done and you want to do a little differently whatever the subject matter may be. So yes, I have a lot of birds and they're sort of probably spoiled because <laughs> I have several uh, feeders for them. And do they eat? They eat a lot. And so do the squirrels. And this year, some of the squirrels feel like I say, oh, they're at the, Ma they think they're at the Marriott because <laughs> usually squirrels will run away from you. But these seem to like think I'm in their territory as opposed to them being in my territory. You're the room so service bringing, bringing goodies. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So getting back to why I took this on and we came about because I wrote a book called caregiving with love and joy an expert's guide to home care with someone who has Alzheimer's and dementia. So with that being said, we came about because you saw my book and you were very curious about it. And so I wrote the book because I felt like having the ability to be in the room and seeing what's going on is different than someone coming into an office for 15 minutes and you're getting their story for 15 minutes but when you're in the room you really get their story the other person's story and you get to see the whole dynamics of the environment and the personalities of the individuals that are in should i say entrenched in the whole process of dealing with this disease and planning which usually there is no plan because mm -mm. every day 
um, I've no, I would notice that people just took it on day by day and there was no team, there was no assistance and one person felt like they should do it all when, and then they take it on and then they realize they can't do it all. But meanwhile, they've pissed everybody off because <laughs> when everybody wanted to help, they thought they could do it all. And now they have no one. And the person that suffers is the person who's the family member with the disease. Yeah, that's true. Because most people don't, most people think it's about them instead of the person they're supposed to care about. Am I right? Or am I wrong? In a lot of respects, yes. I, I've, I've dealt with people who they, you know, mom or dad or spouse is, um, you know, they're, they're having struggles. So you make some adjustments and the next thing, you know, you're up to your eyeballs in taking care of them and their needs. And you have not put into any, you haven't put a system in place to help take care of your needs so that you can maintain your own d dreams and desires and needs. And I just, I see so many people get sucked into a hole they don't know how to get out of. So that's why I wanted to talk to you. Cause I'm like, how do we avoid giving up our entire life be to caregiving? Because my mom was 74 when I became responsible for her and I had just turned 50. So I was not the least bit interested in, you know, the thought that she could live, if she li had lived as long as her mom, uh, math's going to be a struggle. My grand, my maternal grandmother lived with vascular dementia till 91. So what is that? 17 years? Yeah, I was not particularly interested in spending 17 years of post raising a family and, you know, I was still working, but it was like, you know, at some point it was like, it's time for me to be able to do what I want. And I was not the least bit interested in, in giving up everything for my mom. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people. So how do we avoid that? How do you avoid that? I think, and I don't want to say think, I know that what we all need to do is understand health and how to advocate for ourselves and advocate for our loved ones when they can't advocate and putting a plan together that everybody knows they're going to become elderly and no one focuses on that third of their life. They focus on everything and then everything before that, but they just think, oh, I'm going to get old. But that's a process that needs to be taken care of. Whether you have a lot of money or no money, there's still, if you have not enough money, there's still a lot of resources that people do not tap into. And if you have a lot of money, because I've seen both ends, sometimes the people that have a lot of money don't use their money wisely for their care or use any money for their care because they don't want to spend the money on their care and they don't have the proper care. And it just, it's just, it's just a terrible sight to see when you know someone can be doing it better and differently. Yeah. My dad did that. My dad was hesitant to do anything. Like I, he was, he had his own chronic illnesses and he was tired because he didn't let my sister or I help, which was problem number one. So I researched, you know, an adult day program. Did I did all the legwork. All we needed to do was the three of us go and check it out in person. This is obviously pre-COVID. And he just flatly refused. And I never understood why. I mean, it it wasn't was cheap. It, for himself? it was for my mom. Oh, this is okay. Yeah, so that he had time off. Because right. his, his patience with my mother was like nil. She would ask a question. He would answer it. Yes. And then she would ask it again and he'd snap the answer at her. Like she was supposed to remember, which ugh, I used to make me crazy. So I thought, you know, you're, you're tired. He didn't have to keep answering. That's the thing. He didn't have to keep answering her because she didn't even remember that he wasn't answering her. That is so right. that's why I, it's important that we educate us. It's very important to educate ourselves on this disease because right now 
I always say to people, couples, one of you are going to have it. So you need to talk about it early on on what you're going to do. And you can't do it by yourself. And there's programs and there's day programs, too, depend, that are depending on the community that might not cost you what you think it's going to cost you. And like some programs would have required your dad to be there or maybe he could have taken her to a program and then hired someone to sit with her while she was there. And then he could have his time for himself. And a lot of people don't think they don't stretch their mind for creativity, for caregiving. They, they try to make it black and white and it's really not black and white. You got, you have to be creative and you have to have a team of family and friends or you're not going to make it. Whether, you know, I just think caregiving at home is stressful. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, dementia, caregiving, it's even stressful, stressful because you're thinking for that person and they're declining and every day is a different day. It's never the same. And they can't make decisions for themselves. You'd be surprised. It seems like they can make decisions, but they can't make decisions. No. And you have to know when to let go. And, you know, don't, and not to get frustrated because now you're making the decisions for a person that was probably in a, let's say in a relationship making 90% and now they're making 60%. And you're not, you haven't figured out that there's an issue and there is an issue. So that's my take on why it's very important to have a balance because if you keep that speed up as they're declining and then you're making 80% of the decisions, you will be going as nutty as a fruitcake. You will not have time to talk to anybody. What a you won't be able to have a regular conversation with anybody because you're spending so much time with caregiving because... Mm -hmm. And not only will it become more mental for you to, to be caring for this person, but it becomes more physical because they, as they're declining, you're also starting to see a physical decline in what they can do for themselves. Did you see that with your mom and your dad? Um, well, because of my dad's chronic health issues, he was just getting tired and just, just wrung out, which was completely understandable my sister would make um basically slow cooker meals she and a girlfriend would get together and make a variety of meals that were then in a freezer bag and they shared them between the three households my sister the friend and my parents so my dad who was an atrocious eater and an even worse cook my dad was the kind of person that would you know he was in a hurry so he would just turn the burner up to high <laughs> anybody that knows anything about cooking knows like that <laughs> yeah it's it doesn't work it, it would be nice if it worked no, it but it doesn't, doesn't work <laughs> it makes it worse it doesn't work and the, no, no. He, my parents ate a ton of processed food because when my mom became unable to make meals he was he didn't have the desire or the energy to step up and learn how to cook better and make better meals um, now this was between 2005 and 2000, he died in 2017. So we, we know a lot more, even though that's, you know, 2017 is not that far back. We know a lot more. There's a lot more, you know, podcasts and, and books. And there's, there's a lot more ways to learn. Cause he did have a couple of books and I read them both. And one of which is very popular and I just find it very depressing. So I, I always recommend the ones that I think are better. So I'm not going to mention the the popular book. Everybody probably has it anyway. I think the reason why I have my book, because that book is very depressing. <laughs> she knows it's what I'm talking about. I don't want to knock anybody else's book, but, you know, the reason I started this podcast is because you can only read so much and then it's like you got to put things into action. And, you know, if you're taking care of somebody at home, you may not have time to get through a whole book to figure out what may or may not work. So one of the things I always tell people is when you get a diagnosis or when you suspect there's a problem, make a list of every, all your responsibility, every, all the tasks you got to do today, all of the tasks you need to do this week and all the tasks that need to get done every month. And then write down a list of everybody you know 
local, not local, because there's there's things people can do even if they're not in the same town. But also, and this is the crucial part, write down what you think their best task is. You know, I can provide oh, meals. I talk about that. Yeah, I I can provide meals. I could drive places. That's you're right. That's where I talk about how to put that whole team together in the book. But I also talk about, you know, not just having the team, but when the team is available to do all these things, what you should be doing with yourself and that's self-care. So I talk about that through exercise and how to eat nutritionally and how to get resources for yourself and your loved one as you're moving forward in this disease. But also at the same time, the activities that you can do to help that person stay on task. And when I mean stay on task, that they're balanced with a routine because they need a routine so that they can go to program. Because if they're not on a routine, and, the, you know, the, the program will call you wait too long to put them in a program. The program will call you just like the school would call you and say, you need to come pick up your child because they're misbehaving or they're hitting or they're yelling or they're cursing or screaming at the other participants. They won't sit still for an activity. And that's why I tell everyone, get your loved one involved in an activity because then they look forward to the activity. Plus, it helps the dementia and the decline. Uh, I don't want to say you're going to be getting better, but it's a little bit more of a decline postpone, postponed because, you know, they're using their mind. And so mm -hmm. they're in activity that they remember they're supposed to be going to the activity and they look forward to the activity. You only can entertain for so many hours in a day yourself. That is true. Because you get burned. I mean, think about it. How long can you run around with a toddler every day without taking a break? <laughs> that is true. One of the things that I've learned from guests and um, people that follow me on social media or, you know, we follow each other is sometimes your loved one needs to see another face. They are just sick of your face. <laughs> Like, get, I am tired of you. That's I need true. something different. Yeah, and it's normal. Many of us were stuck at home with one or two people, you know, for the better part of a year or more. You know, maybe there's times when it's like, get out of All my right. house. That is so true. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book, too, is making... It's almost like storytelling. And this way you learn more about that person. And then also as you're learning more about that person, your team is learning too of that person. Team members that are able to do things for you, but they really don't know your loved one. And so that's in a way of learning how your loved one is thinking now, but also because they think in the past, they have a very good memory of their past. You learn so much from them. I, when I was caring for my aunt, I learned, even though my parents were very, very open about family history, I still learned some things that I didn't know. And then there was some things that from some stories, I didn't put the two and two together until her and I were talking. And then I had a better understanding of their life, their adult life, their education, who they were as a person, as an adult. And now as they're going through this uh, period of time as what dementia and Alzheimer's, that's a different personality than the person you've known all your life. So you get to see different variations of a person and who they can be. Did that you is find true. that with your mom? A little bit with my dad. My mom and dad met when they were middle teen years, so think she was a sophomore and he was a junior they were like 14 15 15 16 so they there wasn't a lot to discover about her their her past um i found it interesting because she forgot about her sister who was 11 years younger so when she talked about her brothers it was interesting to me that she had forgotten her sister one brother never visited the sister did so that was that was wildly interesting and weird and it, it, it provided me with an array of emotions to explore. Let's put it that way. 
Um, but I wanted to ask you, I think one of the most important topics we can hit on, you said, you know, you've got somebody that's spending time with your person, your loved one. Now you've got to take care of yourself, but l- maybe spend an hour discovering the resources that are available to you. How do you suggest people, where should people start with that? There are tons of resources. They are scattered everywhere. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Right. And, you know, and it goes also by your community. Mm-hmm. So your community, let's say your community is six blocks wide and long, uh, you know, or you've been, vi- a vis- you know, the townships are so close together. You'd be surprised if you live in the township, they'll give you the transportation. If you don't, you don't get the transportation, but you can come to the program. But let's say you need the transportation, too. Then you got to provide, you know, you have to figure out private transportation, you know, or the program might have a stipulation that you can you can't just drop off your loved one. No matter what level they're at, you need to be not maybe in the room, but right outside the room. (coughs) Excuse me. So that if there's an issue. They can come get you to help be with that person that's having an issue. And then you might need to look for a program where you say, you know what? Three days a week, I don't mind sitting there because then I can read or I can do something there, pay some bills or be online right there. But the other two days, I want a program where I can go get my hair done, my nails done. Or if you're having a a team, maybe you're in the morning doing that. And then in the afternoon, you have someone come in and help with the laundry, folding the clothes. They can do that together or go for a walk in the park. So that's your time. You're in the three or four hours every day that someone comes in and spends time with your loved one, you know, to do certain things that you might not like to do and that you can go off and do the things that you want to do, have lunch with a friend. And that's because with this disease, you have to plan your time as much as possible and have people involved early on because then your loved one, even though they might forget that person's name, they will know that person when they walk in by their voice or just the mannerism. Something about that person will click mm-hmm. when they walk in, even though they might not recognize the face or they might not recognize the name, but they, you know that something is clicking there. And I'm sure you've seen that with your mom. Actually, I would always take my mom from the memory care. We'd go, we predominantly would go to the park and watch kids because that was made her happy. It was the, the least stressful, easiest activity to get her to participate in because I tried all the things and she would not. There were things she would do in the community she refused to do with me, which I still don't understand, but that's, that was the reality. But my mom was, her name was Diane and she befriended two other Diane's, which was confusing enough for those of us with, uh, you know, working brains. But I would, um, 
I would take one or or one or e- one of the other Dianes with me, not infrequently, and the the gal that we referred to as other other Diane. So she was the second one befriended. Um, in the beginning, she was so like with it, for lack of a better term. I thought she was a visitor. I didn't realize she was a resident, but she progressed very quickly. And it got to the point where she would look at me and say, you look familiar. Do I know you? And I'd say, well, yeah, I'm here with, you know, my mom. I'm here with her, Um, you know, and I, I would say something as a general reminder of like kind of placing me in a general sense, not like my name is Jennifer and I'm Diane's daughter. That was way too much information. I'm like, yeah, I'm here visiting her. And I'd point at my mom. And she'd be like, no, that's not it. It was so funny. We had that conversation every week until she, I think her visual processing must have gotten bad because then she just stopped even noticing me, which was kind of sad. But, you know, it just, it was really interesting that, you know, the residents that got really comfortable because I was there all the time and I was always doing fun things. You know, I, my mom and other Diane, which was the first one she befriended, I would paint their nails and she was a kick. She was so much fun, this other Diane. And she could still read, which I found fascinating. Um, but she got really super paranoid. And yeah, that's one of the, you know, side, that's one of the side effects of the disease. But, you know, listening to you, did your father pass away before your mom? Yeah. He passed away March of 2017 and she passed away March of 2020. We got to we got to uh, miss all of the trauma and drama of having a loved one in a community during COVID, which was great because I think I would have lost my mind because my mom was not capable of Zoom or FaceTime phone calls or window visits. All none of that would have been available to us. And I don't know what I would have done. But I know a lot of people have pulled their loved ones out of memory care and I get it, but I. Uh, I'm so glad I didn't have to make those decisions. No, it's it's hard. It really is hard. But one of the questions that I do have, did your father pass away, you think, from the stress of being a caregiver? Yeah, he was diabetic. He had a kidney transplant in Mar- March is a, is a month for us. March of 2009. Um, it was a live donation from somebody he knew. And I don't still don't understand why, but he. He just continued on the path of, I'm going to eat what I want and die happy. Trust me, that is not how it ended. And I think he was also on 26 different prescriptions because every time he had a side effect, they'd give him a new drug instead of stepping back and evaluating, you know, because, and, and I blame the medical profession with this more than my dad, but still, you know, the, that's why you have to be able to advocate for yourself and have a good advocate person who's going to these different doctor's appointments. Because my aunt was on, oh, I would say maybe 12 or 15, 12 to 14 pills a day. Oof. And I couldn't understand it. And so I talk about this in the book, too. But I got her down to like four pills a day, like two in the morning and two in the evening, something like that, which is manageable like when my dad technically it was really technically three pills but two of the one of them she was taking twice a day and when my dad came out of the hospital on hospice so they took him off some medications they added new ones they changed others i mean it was just like hello my sister has a you know an mba my husband and i have you know none of us are stupid but it was so stressful it was like uh, if we do the wrong thing, are we going to kill him? Or like, oh, it was awful. And I do have, um, and I don't know where it falls before or after this episode. Um, I talked to a younger pharmacist who is training clinicians on how to de-prescribe medications to this country. You know, we we need to stop looking for a quick fix to what ails us because unfortunately... You know, yes, a pill might help, but it's not it's not the only and final answer. You know, it's not double jeopardy. <laughs> so, but 
you know, that it's, no, I it's wish not. I And, you know, I tell people, no, I'm saying, you tell people that you could probably die from the side effects from all the medication than from the actual disease. Mm-hmm. So he, he wasn't healthy and he was taking care of my mom and he wasn't allowing my sister or I to help, which my sister is four years younger than me, four and a half, but my daughter is 14 years older than my niece. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, my sister had kids at home. She still has kids at home. And, you know, so he was trying, you know, and my husband and I are self-employed. So just lots of reasons, but none of them good. And it was very stressful for me because I could see that they needed help and he was refusing the help. But then he would dump a problem on me out of the blue. And oh, (laughs) he would have benefited so much if he had just taken my advice. I think it was in 2012 to take mom to an adult day program. The one that I investigated that I mentioned earlier did not require him to be there. He did have to take her. That was good. Yeah. I've never heard of one where you actually have to be there. All the ones that I'm familiar with in my old community and the home, my, my, the childhood hometown, or that sounds, doesn't sound correct, but the town I grew up in, um, they were all like eight to two, eight thirty to two. And mm-hmm. one of the issues getting my mom to this program was it was in the next town over. My parents lived across the street from a school and to get mom to this program, they would have also had to pat first. They would have had to get out of their driveway, which was a problem. And then they would have had to pass another elementary, middle school, high school. And the adult day program was basically in the same square blockage of um, a junior college. So I I negotiated that she could show up later because I knew that would be an issue. And he still refused. He wouldn't even go talk to them. Like, "Ah." (laughs) that's a form of denial, too. That could be. Yeah, it's it's a really bad thing. People don't know how to let go so that they can do better care, giving, you know, for themselves. Mostly, if you know, if you're not on board as being a caregiver the right way, you're not really being effective I and efficient, uh, or efficient too with the process because it is really a process and that's where my business background comes in um, because I have operations management and I'm always looking at new processes and you know I think differently because I worked with industrial engineers and and um, engineers chemical and general engineers because I was in manufacturing and manufacturing is all about processing Yep. You know, it doesn't matter what you're making. There's still a process to make it, you know, uh, even though it might be a bolt. It's still a process to make that bolt. It looks very simple, but there is a process, you know, that's true. And so I when I look at this, I look at the different processes. How when you're doing certain things, how can you be very efficient at doing it and be very and, ver- and have a very balanced life and enjoy the things you like to do? Because if you like to go bowling on Thursday nights, you should not have to give that up. You should be able to put a process and a plan together so that you can go bowling on Thursday nights, no matter what. You know, yeah. maybe that day that if you're getting a, a home attendant, maybe the home attendant doesn't mind working evenings like 6 to 10. So maybe you have a home attendant two days a week working 10 to 4, 10 to 2, and then, the, you know, the other two days because you want to do evening activities, they come in at 6 o'clock and give dinner and do the bed care, the bedtime care. So you have to be, it's not, this is not black, the disease, first of all, is not black and white, and caregiving is not black and white. You have to be very flexible, and you have to let people in your situation that may, maybe these individuals were never in your situation. And now you're bringing them into what's going on with you, but they're there now to help. They're not there to judge. That's you true. shouldn't. You shouldn't be people. You shouldn't be picking people that are going to judge you. You should be picking people that are going to really help you with their with their um, attributes and work it in. We're, we're, work it in to meet your needs. That's what I want to say. 
Do you have any suggestions on how people find um, good or reasonable in-home care? Because I know that is a gigantic problem. That, it is a very hard and dynamic issue. You know, staffing agencies, which we know are very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, talk if you're going to church, of course, talk to anybody that you're associated with or the minister and ask, are there any individuals that they can recommend for home attended? Advertise a home attended for yourself and and then make sure you interview them. Make sure you have all the proper documents and, you know, that they're flexible and they're willing to be a companion with your loved one. And, you know, if your loved one is not like critical or bedridden yet, you know, this person can handle like going shopping, taking them shopping and going for walks. Then that's the person you need to hire and look for. And you'd be surprised networking with anybody that, you know, maybe they know someone. Yeah. And but for home care, you definitely have to have the right personality and some people bring people in and then they don't, you got to manage that person just like you were managing someone at work and they're in your home. You're not expecting any kind of craziness, but you can't also expect them to think, Oh, let me go clean the bathroom because the, the person that is my client uses the bathroom. You have to let them know that that's their responsibility, keeping the bathroom clean every week or, you know, helping my loved one wash his or her dishes after we have you have a meal. So you have to set the parameters of what you're expecting of that person. And I was just talking to someone last week and they were feeling guilty because they had someone coming in because their loved one had dementia but they were feeling guilty about spending time for themselves. And I was like, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Everybody's got to have a moment to themselves. Yeah. And to feel like they can move forward. They can rethink. Yeah. If you don't take time for yourself, you're going to, you're going to lose it at the worst possible time. Right. So when you're looking at these resources, I always say go first to your community. What does your community offer? Do you have a community council? Do you have a health community council? Because every community is made up differently. So you need to go to the one person first to pinpoint. And then I also talk about the Alzheimer's Association. They are everywhere. So you should be able to call them in to give you some assistance too. It depends on what kind of assistance you need and what you're looking for at that at that time. But you should be keeping a list of things going on so that you can refer to that, you know, you know how sometimes you're driving and you say, oh, let me jot down this restaurant name or whatever. It's the same concept. You're trying to plan something so you might not need it right away, but you see something that might be uh, that you might need down the road, make a journal and keep a list of prospects or possibilities as you're moving forward and you're starting to under, understand the disease more so about what is needed. But the key is first is to come out of denial and you can start setting your goals and changing the tone of the care for your loved one. That's my thought. Denial I plays a big part. And I then agree. also, when you're advocating for your loved one, it's so much easier to be an advocate for yourself. It's the same techniques. And if you're practicing for yourself, then you can do it for someone else so easily. And you'll know it because you're, what you're doing for that person is listening with a third ear and watching with a third eye. And one thing about advocating for yourself or anyone is being able to take that response from whoever the doctor is, even whether you're in the attorney's office doing life planning, you have to listen with that 
third ear because as things are coming, information's coming to you, you need to be able to throw back a question or two so that the answer to you is expanded even in more detail for you to understand. It's because caregiving, health, legal, it's not an open-ended question, you know, where it's, it's not a closed answer, like a yes or no. It's, it's an open-ended I think I have it right, which way, you know, you're going to take that answer and take it to another level as, and then they're going to throw, they're going to throw that answer at you and you're going to throw another question so that you can get really down to the nitty gritty. Remember that person has 15 or 20 minutes with you or even longer, but that person's not with you for 24 hours for the 365, four days to the next time you see them, you have to be making notes and you have to be able to say what your notes, bring the notes in and say to the doctor, this is what I've collected. This is what's going on as they are interviewing and assessing your loved one. Be prepared. That's having a binder. I don't want to say, you know, if you put all this stuff together and if you get the book, you will see how I have made it so easy for you to be an advocate, to be self-cared for, how to, to get your resources, how to, and it's a book that you keep referring to. You read it, but you keep referring to it. How to keep the right proper clothing for your loved one at certain levels. It is really a very informal, informal book that you really need to purchase because you're not going to just read the book one time. You're going to read the book and you're going to refer back to this because everybody with this disease declines differently. Everybody's economics is a little different. Every culture is different because you got to, we didn't talk about culture, but every culture is different. Every tradition is different. So all of that goes into the caregiving. Caregiving is not black and white and people shouldn't make it black and white. No, it's basically all shades of gray. Yes. And you have to put it all together that fits you. Remember, what I, when, I, when I'm talking about this, you're the caregiver. So you're the team leader. So you have the ability to say, I don't want to do this at this time. Somebody else needs to pick this up. Or I'm tired of doing this and I need to have another team person pick this up. But if you've never developed a team from the very beginning, it's very hard to get a team in the middle to the end, you know, because they're seeing things really drastic and they're running in a different direction as opposed to if they were in there in the very beginning, that the decline doesn't seem rapid. It doesn't seem overwhelming. It's just every day is a different twist to the story and you can handle it a lot better. You, when you were saying that, you know, you were talking about caregiving, uh, the thought popped into my head that, and I always thought of myself as the team captain for mom's care team. I was in charge, even though she was in memory care. You know, when when one of the ladies, one of the caregivers that was responsible for mom told me, you know, your mama needs this and your mama need that. I'm like, I wish you had told me that when we were on the way out, but that's fine. I will go to the drugstore and get the whatever, the toilet paper, whatever items she needed, and I will come back. You know, because it was either that or I would have to make a separate trip. But... If you think of yourself as the CEO of caregiving, you're not going to run the whole company by yourself. This is my entrepreneur side talking and you were in business. And I'm, I'm wondering if that thought process, while it sounds very kind of clinical and a little cold, I think thinking about it from a different perspective. But I you think know, it's something that people need to think about in everything they do. You can't do everything, no, even if it's with your children. Even it's, if it's at work, the, it's the better to know if you are the lead manager or the CEO or the director, who can be on your team to make everyone successful on the team. And that's including yourself. Because if you know how to, and that's where operation, that's why I say I use my operations experience because in operations, that's one of the things you learn to do is have teams and how, 
have coordinators and have assistants. Maybe you need a coordinator that knows the computer better, that can put everybody's schedule together and know and put a whole um, binder together for you on what needs to be. Maybe they, they're what you would call your administrative assistant, okay? And that's the person that's gonna keep you on the timeline. It's gonna keep you up to date on everybody's um, schedule while you're in the while you are maintaining what's going on every day with your loved one you're keeping notes on that maybe the administrative part is too much for you now so you have somebody on the team that's doing that maybe you like your loved one likes fresh fruit so you have someone on a team that goes to the farmer's market every week and get the the fruit and drop it off you have to know what's available to you. You might be in a community like my aunt where they gave, they had a grant to give free housekeeping. Uh, so she would come over for four hours. She would clean the house, my aunt's apartment. They would wash the clothes together. They would put the clothes together. She would clean and my aunt would help with a little dusting and then, and then two hours later, I mean, because it's a one bedroom apartment, it's one person and it's only so much cleaning you need because this person's not cooking anymore. You know, their meals are being dropped off. You know, you got to keep that in consideration. They would go out to have lunch and then they would go for walks at different parks. That was four or five hours. That's free for someone to do something different every week for themselves. Maybe it's going every other week to get your nails and your hair done or a haircut uh, or going to play uh, golf with a friend you know it's because it's not just women it's men that's doing this too and women play golf and men play golf so you gotta you know men are getting manicures and pedicures too today so everybody has to think in a neutral kind of situation and mindset you have any clue as to why people get so sucked in to the point of overwhelm like why do we we don't try to do everything for our kids at least i didn't my daughter's almost 31. And why do we feel like we need to do that for our, our spouse or our parent? Like what, what well, flips, what is. switch gets flipped? Blah, I can't say that. <laughs> I know the, your position switches. And I think what people have a hard time doing, especially with their parents, knowing that they are now the parent and they're taking the role slowly and slowly and slowly. And they don't want the role or they don't want... I shouldn't say they don't want what they can't do is from my observation is understanding that now the parent that was disciplining, giving advice, telling them what to do is now your responsibility. And believe me, they want it to be your responsibility because they're so confused. So it's stressful for them. And that's why I say they pick a person they think in the beginning they can totally rely on and at times manipulate because they still have their memory. And so they need that person to cover up on certain things and be their defense. You know, I think yep, I played that role. Yeah. And everybody else is on the sideline saying, mm, this is not making kind of, any kind of sense here. Why isn't she taking this approach? And they are, they're seeing things differently. So my thought process is it's in the beginning, it's a denial of, with the person that's now seeing that they're having mental issues. So they still want to keep the control of the independence that they have. So maybe what you would say, the person that they're relying on is the weakest link in a lot of ways because they're the person that's going to cover up for you in the beginning. And they're the one, they're the individual that might stay in denial longer when everybody else is seeing there's an issue and they're making excuses for you. But that's what that person wanted in the first place because they wanted to keep their independence for as long as they could. Putting a care team will help you help them maintain their independence. Yes, but it all comes down to us educating ourselves before the disease hits so that when it does hit, it's not overwhelming. Why is it happening to me? Because the way the statistics shows, if you're a couple, there's a chance that you, one of y'all are going to have it. 
And then the stress will bring on, if you don't plan this properly, because I've seen this over and over, either the loved one passes away or maybe six or seven months after the loved one passes away, the spouse or the loved one now has signs of dementia from all the stress and being confined, you know, without a routine for themselves, except for someone who has dementia. So we all have to look at this differently and educate ourselves before it actually happens. That's definitely (laughs) true. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Yes. What I would like people to understand is that when you're preparing to go to graduate from high school, you go through kindergarten through 12th grade and you're preparing yourself, whether it's for college, a trade school, to go to work, there are skill sets you're learning along the way. And that's what needs to be done with this caregiving, especially when someone is at home. And like you said, you are the CEO, even if your loved one is in a, a caregiving situation, because you have to manage that facility and the employees that are working there about your loved one and who that person is. And maybe you know that a social activity that's posted on a calendar will not work for your loved one. We can't have that activity. We need to do this activity with this one, with my, my mother or my father, because you know playing cards is agitating to them, but doing a puzzle is re- relaxation for them. It's more creative. You know, it's not confusing. So you just need to find out and then also find out what they like. But also as the time goes on, you'll see that they develop other interests too that you would have never thought. And that's because they're sitting there, they're quiet, and their mind might be going back to their childhood where they were doing certain things. But then as they become an adult, that activity now no longer interested them. But now that they're sitting around and reflecting and living in the past, that activity now becomes a lot of fun again to them. So that's why you got it. That's why you have to know who your person is that you're caring for. That's why you have to do the plan, the love heart. Know who your person is that you're caring for. It'll make things easier. And that would have been good advice to know with my mom because... Most of the other traditional advice didn't work, which is how this whole podcast came to be. Um, Patricia's book is linked in the show notes. She's given you a lot of good reasons why you should check it out. Um, so I, I'm going to second that. And, and I'm going to show it one more time. Wait a minute. <laughs> da da. Caregiving with love and joy, and the O is a flower. It is awesome. Yes. Yes. Well, I have appreciated this this chat today with all the birds in the background. It's been very relaxing. I am having to listen to the oh, now they stop mowing the, the I'm on a golf course, so they've been dealing with the lawn all day. I wish they'd stop. And but it's I did okay. I not hear it. Yeah, it's far enough away, I think it's it's fine. And um Zoom suppresses the background noise, so that's cool. But yes, you have your birds. We have hummingbirds. And right now they're getting really nasty with each other over the feeder. So (laughs) it was nice (laughs) listening to your birds. I guess one hummingbird was chattering at my husband because my husband um, had the nerve to be on our deck. And so then he went over and touched the hummingbird feeder and it squawked at him even more. (laughs) So, you know, nature is very entertaining and very very beneficial. Yes, so I appreciate that you, soothing. yeah, you, you brought it to the podcast today. So once again, I thank I Patricia try to for do her- that as much as possible for when I'm doing podcasts or interviews, I try to bring it the outside in because, you know, being inside all the time can be very depressing too. So I like to bring a different perspective. Well, I appreciate it. I love being outside, even though it's supposed to be 97 today, I'm going to go have lunch on the deck and before it gets too, too hot. But again, I appreciate this. I want you guys to all look at her book as an artist and an entrepreneur, entrepreneur myself. Blah. Tongue is not working yes. anymore. And then also, if you have any questions, feel free to call me or, or send me an email or a text message and I can answer your questions or help you go in the right direction. 
So to feel free to do that too, as you're reading the book. And also while you're reading the book, it's also remember, you're going to bring it off the shelf a few times. So make sure you bookmark certain things that you think you're going to want to refer to in the, fu in the future or refer to it a few times as you're going through this process. Well, I'm going to recommend caregiving with love and joy to anybody that's got an, an older person in their life, because this is so much, the more, you know, the easier this is. And I have learned as much since my mom passed away as I knew before. So I can say that definitively, because there are a lot of things I would have done different had I had this conversation with you five years ago or, you know, many of my other guests. So once again, I appreciate it. I want you guys to all check out her book. And for everybody that's hung in to the end, you guys just got a really good offer. So take, take advantage of that as well. Thank you once again. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.